Welcome to the Soul and Stone podcast. I'm Garrett Ryan, and my guest today is Dr. Elizabeth McCauley, associate professor um, of classics, digital humanities, and Middle Eastern studies at the City University of New York's Graduate Center. Professor McCauley, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, well, very much likewise. Um, so I recently read your book about antiquity in Gotham, um, all about New York's ancient architecture or faux ancient architecture, drawing upon many sources from Greek and Roman to the Near East. And I wanted to get into the, the weeds about this, really explore um, how and why antiquity has been referenced in the built environments of New York, of America's premier city. And so to, to plunge right in, um, you describe modern architecture modern, ar modern architecture that's been influenced by ancient models as neo-antique. Could you explain this term and why you find it useful? Absolutely, because oftentimes when you hear, this is not a term that people use on a day-to-day -day basis. People will talk about neoclassical architecture. Um, and one of the reasons why I like this term better, which I uh, kind of came about with a colleague of mine at Brock University, Catherine von Stockelberg, when we were both starting to get interested in kind of the afterlife or the reception of ancient architecture and gardens uh, was because not everything was classical. Um, we kept seeing Egyptian uh, material culture that was being referenced, art and architecture, ancient Near Eastern, um, and also classical. See, Heather, if you say neoclassical, it kind of sounds like this monolithic thing, like Greece and Rome were the same and they meant the same thing to everybody. And what we started to see was that people would be maybe using Roman architecture for a specific reason and Greek architecture and then Egyptian and ancient Near Eastern for different reasons. Um, and also what we found out as we started researching it was like the Egyptologists are way ahead of us. Um, they have mm -hmm. been looking at, you know, Egyptomania, as they call it, but really Egyptian revival styles for a long time. And they that, in fact, a lot of this material that was or, or these buildings that were looking at classical art and architecture, Greek and Roman, were in conversation with this. So it, it was kind of to be like a more of a universal term or catch all, but also to help us think about what we really meant when we were understanding it. So when I would look at a building and said, oh, that's all Greek architecture, that's Roman. But then did the people who were building that building think about it that way? So it just helped us to kind of also compare and not silo information, which is something that scholars do all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I mean, I, I myself am guilty of this, too, thinking about Egyptian as being a whole different category from neoclassical, when in fact, right, it's a much broader and deeper field of reference than just, you know, culture X, culture Y, culture Z. Um, so to begin with, with the first great wave of neo-antique influence in New York, um, why did Greek revival architecture become so prominent in early 19th century New York? And uh, what kinds of buildings, uh, what kinds of references are made with this style? So um, there is a lot of what might be called Greek revival or Grecian, Greek-like, Greek-inspired architecture, uh, particularly from the early 19th century in the United States and particularly in New York. And part of that is you have to go back to the political context and kind of geopolitical events that are occurring. So first of all, you've had the, the founding fathers were raised on the classics. They are very into Greek and Latin, and they look to the Roman Republic and then the Athenian democracy of the 5th century BCE as really models. Um, and that um, kind of Athenian democracy and ideas really comes to the forefront in the early part of the 19th century. And even as you get into the 1820s, you have the Greek War of Independence. So many Americans are seeing parallels about what's happening in the Greek world and, uh, you know, Greeks throwing off the oppression of the Ottoman Empire as akin to what they had done themselves in throwing off the British, um, the British Empire. So there's that kind of political thought process, but also this is a very new country. This is a new nation. It does not have a lot of architecture. It doesn't have an old tradition. And so if you're looking for an architecture that is well-regarded, well-established, and has appropriate kind of political overtones, you can't you can't go wrong with a bunch of nice looking Greek temples. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing to say that influenced um, and how we get to some of these buildings in New York is that there are these publications that are circulating. So most Americans um, had never been to Greece. Obviously, Greece, you know, at this point, still under the control of the Ottoman Empire. The Grand Tour hadn't really gotten going. Most of the Americans are going to start going in the 1850s, 1860s, 70s, much later than their European counterparts, but there were publications like the Antiquities of Athens by James Stewart and Nicholas Rivette. And so we know that there are copies of these books and copies uh, that are circulating uh, in the U.S. And so people are looking at them and they're reading them and they are familiar with 
the Parthenon as a result. And so it's not surprising that a number of Greek temples start showing up. And so in New York, one of the best earliest examples is the U.S. Customs House, uh, which is on Wall Street, still there today. It's known as Federal Hall today. It doesn't get that name until the 1950s. Um, But it is really one of the first big public or civic buildings. Um, And it's important for what it was. It was built from the early 1830s um, and finished in 1842 by Ethel Town and Andrew Jackson Davis, who are like the earliest, most successful kind of American architects. Um, So this building looks like the Parth, uh, looks like the Parthenon when you come up and see it. And part of what, why it was built to be so impressive is most of the U S government, the federal government got its, um, revenue from trade tariffs. So we're all used to today, we pay income tax, we pay uh, lower, you know, state taxes, local tax, all those things. But the federal government had tariffs. And so when you would arrive in New York, which was the largest harbor by tonnage in the United States, you would show up and have to declare your goods. And you would go to this customs house. And I I have this image of this merchant walking, like he's just, you know, been on a boat from maybe from, you know, Newcastle and he gets there and he's expecting this is New York. It's dirty. The streets Mm -hmm. aren't paved. It's kind of horrible. I get there. And then there's this Grecian temple. It has no sculpture in it, but it's a Doric temple. It's spectacular. And I have to think like it was designed to impress. Mm -hmm. It was designed to say we have permanence, but also we are serious about our endeavor and we are going to build buildings that show that we can last the test of time. So it has this kind of public dynamic and civic dynamic at the same time. Uh, little, little, little temples start showing up as banks. Um, and I think that's partially because A, the design is very useful. You mm-hmm. know, you kind of, if you think about the design of a temple, it has a cella and you go in it. Um, and the space is vertical. You can put a bunch of desks, you can store things. So there are a bunch of small scale banks that are built, many of which don't survive in New York. They only survive in etchings um, that were all over lower Manhattan. And obviously there's a big fire. Um, in the 1830s, which destroys a number of these buildings, and then they're subsequently rebuilt. And later on, we'll start to see Roman-style temples being used, um, Roman-style architecture being used in some of these uh, these buildings too. But it, it catches on pretty quickly. I mean, there's the, um, you know, the first bank in Philadelphia also looks like a Parthenon. And mm-hmm. so you can see that there's starting to be like New York is part of a conversation that is both in the United States and also referencing ancient architecture. Um, but the other thing that's really cool is um, Greek architecture also gets used in a very different way. It gets used for the first retirement home in New York City, um, mm-hmm. which is a place called Snug Harbor on Staten Island. So I recommend anyone should definitely take the Staten Island Ferry and go see this. Um, started with three basically um, Ionic style temples. Um, and it was a it was a retirement community for merchant marines for people who had been sailors, um, and um, that was built in the 1830s and then expanded around 1880. Um, and it's it's again this connection to kind of a civic undertaking. That mm-hmm. um, but it also I think is is interesting about it because it it kind of shows that there's respect for people's service uh, to the country to the economy. Um, and that that should be dignified with a certain type of architecture. So it also just really shows how flexible mm-hmm. Greek forms could be at that time. Oh, yes. You know, I, I went, I did my PhD at Michigan. And all around southeast Michigan, um, there's these farmhouses from the 1830s and 40s with uh, Greek detailing, often very mm-hmm. simple, just, you know, a broad band, a broad cornice maybe, and trim on the corners. But it's, uh, again, the vernacular translation of these grand civic buildings that may be being built in places like New York and embodying the same, I guess, in, in some sense, the same spirit that, you know, we're part of this new republic, and here's our, our reference to that. Um, so to move on uh, to a very different field of reference, um, in the same period, though, I'm very intrigued by the Egyptian motifs used to decorate the so-called tombs prison complex, um, and also the distributing re- reservoir of the Croton Aqueduct in the mid-19th century. Now, why was such an exotic architectural language uh, applied to these very high-profile projects? Well, it's it's a great it's a great question because yes, it's important to remember that the Croton Reservoir, the um, distributing reservoir, is being built exactly at the same time that um, the Customs House Federal Hall is being built. So they are so you're clearly sitting there going like people have the option to do both, but they're picking the styles for different reasons. So I'll start with the reservoir and then go to the tombs. Mm-hmm. So the reservoir is partially the perception of what Egyptian architecture is about. It is massive. It is technologically advanced. I think Egypt was 
coming out of the 18th century and the early 19th century, Egypt was viewed as a technologically powerful and sophisticated civilization. It had built pyramids that had lasted millennia. Like how could, you know, how could you not admire that? And also again, um, the description of Egypt, which was published under Napoleon, which, you know, when Napoleon ran off to invade Egypt, he took a bunch of scholars with him, um, and kind of on the model of Alexander the Great. So, you know, everybody's referencing everybody here. Um, but those scholars documented buildings and they documented them very well. So they, this volume, I think this was maybe 20 volumes and it was circulating again in the U.S. So people referenced it and looked at it. But people were, uh, architects were very impressed with the, the kind of solidity and strength of these Egyptian buildings. So if you wanted to show you were technologically advanced, i.e. in terms of infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, Egyptian architecture could really offer you that. Um, also, there are some design elements. You know, our, uh, Egyptian architecture kind of slants up at an angle. That's not a bad thing for when you're dealing with water pressure. Mm -hmm. um, so when this was built, so this occupied the area basically between Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue, um, between 40th and 42nd Street. It is currently under New York Public Library. So if you go down, you can actually get into the basement sometimes, or you can go down, you can see all of the gray granite uh, and stone that's underneath it. It's foundation when it was taken apart in the 1890s. It's still actually under there. It's one of the coolest things you can see in New York. It's kind of, again, the archaeology of hmm. New York. Um, but that was really the desire to do that. There's, But they also really were aware that they were using Egyptian architecture in the actual bill for um, the cost of it, they decided to pay extra to have an Egyptian style cornice over the entrances. So it was really very thoughtful. Also, the super cool thing was you could walk up to the top and promenade around the top and see New Jersey hmm. and Brooklyn. So not only was it like an, an infrastructural piece, but it was kind of a public amenity. Um, and then they, they, uh, the water arrived on July 4th, 1842, and they gave water away for free, um, which was a big deal because New York had never had a, a clean, a good source of water before this. Um, so it was to show, that kind of shows that the United States and New York is technologically advanced. At the same time, that kind of point of being very solid and very serious applies, unfortunately, potentially very well to prison architecture and tomb architecture. At least that seems to have been the rationale. So a man named John Haviland is the one who designed the tombs, and he also designed other prisons um, in uh, Philadelphia and in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, and he was his thing was kind of prison architecture, um, but he also had a copy of the description of Egypt. So he, it seems to have been, for him, a very purposeful way of looking at Egyptian forms. Now, he submitted one of the five designs um, Andrew Jackson Davis, who had designed the customs house, also submitted one that was half Greek and half Egyptian, kind <laughs> of weird. So just to show that that's why I like this idea of neo-antique, because people mm -hmm. are looking at borrowing it both ones. But he designed this to look, you know, very serious. And the, the tombs itself had um, a prison complex where people could wait. There was, there was a lot of debates about how prisons should work in the 19th century, whether people should be held in solitary confinement or together. If they were in solitary confinement, then they couldn't corrupt each other. I mean, it's a very different way of thinking about prisons and prison architecture. Um, but you had the prisons and then you also had the court. So it was kind of one-stop shop for um, you know, the judicial system in the United States, in New York City at this time. Um, but it wasn't, while it was very pretty from the outside and um, aesthetically pleasing, the building didn't work very well. It was situated on the old Collect Pond in New York. Mm. So the Collect Pond was, you know, this original source of water. They covered it up. Um, they had issues almost immediately with the building where they had moisture coming up. They had... Um, other uh, sewage related issues. And so eventually the building was considered inhumane and not good as a prison because it was not, it did not have sanitary and good conditions. So, you know, these two kind of infrastructure solidity, those are two of the major mm -hmm. associations with Egyptian architecture. And then the other one, which I'm sure we'll talk about is, is the, is the funerary and commemorative because, mm -hmm. you know, you can't beat an obelisk for a tombstone. <laughs> right. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating that there was this idea of doing a half Greek, half Egyptian design. I, 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 you think it's so incompatible or so distinctive that you couldn't mash them together that way, but I guess so. Well, I think yeah. that's the thing. It's like, I think these mm -hmm. architects sometimes are looking at the different uh, books and they're like, oh, I kind of like this. I kind of like that. Let <laughs> right. me put it together. And then mm -hmm. as an archaeologist, you sit there and you look at a building and you're like, oh my goodness, my brain is going to explode. <laughs> How did you do all this? And then I immediately go, well, why? Why did they think that was okay mm -hmm. or normal? And trying to understand the psychology of, you know, an, an early 19th century American architect who 
thinks that that's kind of cool. And I think it looks weird. <laughs> right, right. No, it's fascinating. Yeah. So moving forward a couple decades, um, many Gilded Age mansions in Manhattan featured so-called Pompeian rooms. What are some of the uh, characteristic features of these spaces? And why did they become so popular among New York's elite in this period? Um, well, I guess you've got to have a Pompeian room or something <laughs> like that to fit in mm -hmm. with, the, with the in crowd. Um, so I think there are a couple of things that happened even before these, these mansions that are built after the Civil War, where you have tremendous uh, fortunes being uh, developed in the U.S. You know, you've got the largest concentration of millionaires. Uh, they're in New York. Um, but we have to start with Pompeii's situation because Pompeii originally was, you know, the sin, the, the place of moral depravity. Mm. You know, they all got you know, killed by fire and brimstone because they were corrupt. And we can see that because we look at these wall paintings that show people in erotic poses. So they're really bad morally. So that's why fire rained down about them. So that's the original, like it's luxury, it's opulence, it's not positive. And that persists for a while, but then there's a book that kind of plays on that, but also makes it really popular. And that's Edward Bullet Layton's mm. The Last Days of Pompeii um, in 1834, which is a, you know, runaway bestseller. Everybody reads it. It is the book you have to read if you're there in 1834. It's what you have to talk about at the Christmas party. Um, but he has this large description of a house in the beginning part of the book. And it's based on the House of the Tragic Poet. And you read it and it's fascinating. And the book became really, really popular. So you have that. And then you have European aristocrats who have Pompeian rooms because they've been on the grand tour and they bought some stuff. And then they're like, oh, I should have a Pompeian room. So the combination of you know, kind of uh, aristocracy in the UK uh, in particular, um, and this book meant that people were interested in recreating Pompeian rooms. Um, it also fits well with a design trend in the late 19th century, which is the aesthetic movement. It's kind mm -hmm. of like the anecdote to industrialization. It's like we want to have handmade, artisanal, bespoke spaces. And we're going to show our cultural sophistication by having a series of different kind of historical rooms. So you could have a Pompeian room, but you could have like a Tudor dining room. You could have an Italian palazzo ballroom. It could be Venetian style. So it's mm -hmm. a little bit of like, oh, I've just been on the grand tour and I saw all these fabulous things and I'm building myself a new mansion mm -hmm. and I'm going to have everything. And so, you know, I say that slightly flippantly um, because it, some people were doing it definitely to fit in, but then other people it seems very thoughtful. So there was a man named Henry G. Marquand um, who made a lot of money in railroads and mining, uh, but he loved music. Like he had gone to boarding school and he hated it. And I think he played the violin. So he loved music. So he would host concerts at his home and he was building himself a mansion on Madison and 68th. Richard Morris Hunt was designing it and he has a Greco Pompeian music room. And he drew on Greek elements and Pompeian elements to create this room together. And it has some of the most beautiful pieces of art in it. It has Lawrence Almatadema's um, uh, listening to Homer, everyone's sitting there. Because Lawrence Almatadema, the painter, who was a Dutch, an Anglo-Dutch painter, he designed the whole room. Mm -hmm. So he worked with Marquand and he helped pick out this, you know, this, he painted this painting for it. He had Frederick Layton do the ceiling with the muses and with um, other classical references. There's a quote from uh, Aeschylus in the room in Greek. There are actual antiquities that he had. Um, he had attic vases and a trust in ceramics. Um, and then he also um, commissioned Alma Tadema to design this piano that was a Steinway custom piano that has all this detailing laid in woodwork laid on top of it. So it has inlaid work and it has the name of Apollo and the muses and it has a, it's fallboard has a painting of musicians on it. Um, and uh, actually even the down to the details of the claw of the piano bench is based on a how uh, based on a table from one of the houses in Pompeii that Alma mm. Tadema had visited and took pictures of. So this room was designed for a man who loved music. It has all these references to music. Um, so it was a very personal one. So I'm always very fond of this room. And you actually can see the painting is in Philadelphia. And the piano is now in the Clark Institute uh, up in Massachusetts. Um, but it's interesting because this fine line of creating these amazing spaces, there is a fine line. Because at one point, people also thought maybe he had spent too much money because the piano cost almost $47,000 um, in the 1890s, even before Alma Tadema had his design fee. So when you adjust all the costs, it was about 
$7 million if you, equiv- if you did the inflation mm-hmm. rate for 2017, which is exorbitant. And so many, a few people, there was a lot of comments in the press that this was too much luxury. So that, that kind of Pompeii line again goes mm-hmm. back. Sometimes luxury is fine, but not too much luxury. Um, so it was the thing you had to have. And um, he definitely had it in spades. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Well, that's fascinating. You know, this dynamic of Pompeii as being both an inspiration and possibly a cautionary tale. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that there, there's a small art, art, art museum at, at the Michigan campus that has, uh, I think it's the, the slave girl Nydia from Bower Lytton's uh, book. You know, it's yes. this, this prominent marble sculpture there in the center. It's been there since the beginning because it was such an influential work that they had to have a Nydia. Um, Absolutely. I mean, who right. doesn't want to have one? You read the books. Right, and you're, right. I mean, it's a great read. <laughs> <laughs> um, so moving forward again in time a little bit, um, the absolute apogee of classical or perhaps neo-antique influence in New York um, appears to have occurred around the beginning of the 20th century um, under the influence of the City Beautiful movement. Mm -hmm. Could you explain the widespread appeal of this movement, both in New York and elsewhere in the U.S., um, and why its designs are so closely tied to Roman architecture above all? Yeah, I mean, so the City Beautiful really movement, you know, it has, it really reaches its peak under Daniel Burnham in the 1890s and 1900s and coming out of the Chicago World's Fair. It, there are origins before it and the idea of beautifying cities. So you have to remember, first off in the United States, it is going through a tremendous period of industrialization and urbanization. We're going to move, the United States is going to move from being primarily a rural uh, economy to one that is in cities. You have industrialization. And the cities that are being created are pretty horrible places to live. They are dirty. They are filled of slums. They are they are hard places to live in. They are not beautiful in any way. They are rapidly developing. Um, and New York is like it's fascinating to look at pictures of New York as you can see the architecture kind of advancing up Manhattan and mm-hmm. then also in Brooklyn and Queens going going east. Um, but the cities, you know, a lot of it was makeshift and temporary. Um, and so I think part of what's happened, and this comes from. Chicago's white city is also this belief in the progressive era that architecture and design can make people's lives better. Um, we might think this is a cynical thing, you know, us cynical people of the 21st century go, how can design and things mm-hmm. make, how can you believe you can change everyone's lives through design? Although, I mean, there's a whole field of city planning, which believes you can plan and do things. So part of it is really this idea that if you could plan civic centers and you could plan parts of cities or grid them, that that would be a more effective way of creating urban spaces that people would enjoy being in. They would be better in terms of services and functionality. And a lot of that comes out of the Chicago World's Fair and the Court of Honor, which is the central Hmm. kind of piece of the Chicago White's Fair, which the most important American architects worked on. Um, Richard Morris Hunt, Charles uh, Follett McKim, Louis Sullivan, um, all of these very important people were there working on them. Um, And I think part of it is also, you know, Roman design and particularly Roman city design survived reasonably well in the archaeological record. We know there Mm -hmm. are grids. We know they're organized. And they also have kind of urban centers that could be replicated. If you think about the organization of a forum and a capitolium, you know, whether you're thinking in Pompeii or you're thinking in a different part of of the provinces, there are often these civic centers that roads all kind of converge onto, mm-hmm. kind of creating a heart for that city. And I think that's part of the idea that happens. So you go to places like San Francisco, Cleveland, and New York, mm-hmm. that they create these city kind of civic centers. And so in New York, that's fully square, um, which is just north of the Manhattan Municipal Building. And it's got, it ends up having a number of the courts around it and other public buildings. And so you walk there and it's almost like you've arrived in a little Roman forum that happens to be in lower Manhattan, not in Gaul or Germania. Um, And the thing is, some of these are really beautiful spaces, but the problem is they weren't integrated well enough, I think, into the economic and normal lives of cities. So you only go to Foley Square if you've got jury duty in Manhattan, if you live in Manhattan. Um, You know, you don't go there otherwise unless you're on some type of official business. And so you can see both the, you know, successes and failures. At the same time, you think the Macmillan plan of Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. that comes directly out of Burnham's work. And that's one of the things that makes the city so grand and so probably impressive as the nation's capital. So 
that is really effective in creating a grandeur that a lot of American cities didn't have and would not have had not this group of architects thought that they could improve the lives of New Yorkers, you know, San Franciscans, wherever everybody was from, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And that makes sense. There's just this impulse to change these industrial cities. Um, well, it would seem kind of, you know, a, a Jacob Reese style, other half living, you know, in slums, whatever else, uh, into a grand classical vision of order and efficiency. Um, intriguingly, here in Chicago, where, where I'm from, um, you know, Jackson Park, where there was the white city, there's almost nothing left besides the lagoons themselves and the, the museum. But they have a, a half, I think it's a half scale um, model of the, the Republic statue that's sort of the head of the Court of mm. Honor. Um, Big Mary, I think she was called. And, um, but it's in the middle of a traffic circle now. It's kind of uh, lost <laughs> its effect a bit. Um, anyway, so moving on with New York um, in this era of the city beautiful at the turn of the 20th century. Um, the building from this period that intrigues me the most, I think, uh, is Penn Station. Mm-hmm. Not least because, of course, it's gone. You know, it's the great uh, loss of the urban renewal era of the 50s and 60s. Can you just tell us a bit about this spectacular structure that quoted Roman architecture in so many ways? Oh, it was just, it's the one building I wish I'd seen in New York, mm-hmm. but it, it long left before me. So I, I make do with Grand Central Terminal, which is also modeled on a bath building. Mm-hmm. Um, who doesn't love the old Penn Station? Um, so... It was designed by Charles um, Follett McKim of the legendary firm McKim, Mead and White. And he was actually ending, it was going towards the end of his life when he designed it. Um, and he would not, he would die before it would actually be finished. But it's really interesting because it is specifically looking at Roman architecture and it is looking at the Baths of Caracalla. So he actually, McKim actually visited the Baths of Caracalla in 1902 with Daniel Burnham. They went on this big tour, a bunch of architects. And what's fascinating is McKim went and visited it. And he actually hired Italian laborers to walk through the baths so he could look at them walking and moving. Hmm. This is fascinating because we tend to see like the formal structures, but he's actually looking at this as a design issue. And I think part of it is because Roman baths and train stations actually have similar sets of issues Um, because baths have to circulate people around. There's an order. You got to go to all the different pieces. You got to remember to come back. You got to get your clothes. I mean, if you don't have a slave, you have to, you have a cycle, but train stations are actually also pretty similar in that. Like if somebody knows that their train leaves from track 39 and that's the train they have to be on, they need to be able to get there. So you have to be able to circulate large numbers of people efficiently and baths really provide one of the earliest opportunities to really cycle people through spaces really well. If we think, you know, baths could be of a bath complex like the Baths of Caracol, they could shut down half of it if they had to fix the other half and everyone could still circulate. So one of the things that McKim was looking at was certainly like, how can you use the design of baths to design good train stations? So that's one piece. And then the other thing is the baths are spectacular. And that was really what he was going for also in terms of uh, basically creating a new type of gateway to the city. And and the design works really well. So, you know, with, uh, with Penn Station, it was a steel frame. And there is veneers of travertine marble, all these different materials. It's actually very similar in that sense to the construction of Roman baths where you have – you know, brick and concrete core, and then you put Mm -hmm. the veneer veneer over. And so in that sense, it struck me that not only was he looking at it in terms of like aesthetics, but also design and functionality. Um, And so it's a really clever adaptation of an ancient form of architecture that works really well in a new capacity. Um, And it also becomes like, this is the entrance to New York. This is how you arrive Mm -hmm. in New York um, and actually, it was Whitney Warren who design, was one of the designers of Grand Central Terminal. He said, these are our new triumphal arches. These are our new ceremonial gateways. And I have to say, I mean, I spend a lot of time going out of the – I used to spend a fair amount of time going out of the old Penn State, the new Penn Station under mm-hmm. Madison Square Garden, and it's miserable. Every time I go to Grand Central, I just go, ah, oh, because it's beautiful. And mm-hmm. you feel you feel there and you feel a pride in the city you live in, that you work in, and that means that – those buildings achieve that. And that's a really wonderful thing in a modern city and a chaotic world where you can have a moment where you look at a building and go, wow, this is just amazing. And I get to walk through it as a normal person every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess that my close analog to that effect is here in Chicago, we have our Union Station, which is also a turn of the century, grand neoclassical pile. And uh, you get there off my riding Amtrak, which is never a fulfilling experience. <laughs> no. And so the, going yeah. from the agony of Amtrak to, you know, this classical calm grandeur is, it's a nice, uh, I don't know, antidote, I suppose. 
Um, so we're continuing in this era of uh, the Union, of, of at least the Grand Stations, the City Beautiful, we also see at the turn of the 20th century, the rise of the so-called lobster palaces, uh, New York's <laughs> first fine restaurants. Um, why did so many of these establishments have Roman decor? Um, well, I have to say, again, the lobster palaces are kind of wonderfully bonkers. And the reason why I think a lot of them use Roman architecture, or they say they're using Roman architecture, and then you look at the stuff and you realize they're using anything. They're using mm-hmm. Roman, they're pulling all these things. But part of it is the associations of luxury. Because one of the things that, you know, at the start of the American experiment, um, is that we were all good citizen farmers. Uh, you know, George Washington, you know, goes back, he sits under his tree, he does all those things, people are going to read about Cato, you're a good Republican farmer, you fight, you go home, you live on your farm, you're good. Now it's a little bit more like, well, those emperors are looking kind of good. And we're really kind of affluent, we're doing really well. And maybe we're exceptional. I mean, you can see the rise of American exceptionalism Mm. at the same time. But what's interesting in some of the sources, uh, so Murray's Roman Gardens was one of these lobster palaces, um, and there's a whole publicity piece about it. And basically, rather than saying Pompeii is luxurious and not good, they're saying Pompeii is the Newport of the ancient Roman world. (laughs) And of course, Newport is where um, the Vanderbilts, uh, you know, everybody who was anybody, an an industrialist, would build their cottages. Um, Cottages are a a misnomer. Mm -hmm. You know, these are huge mansions like Marble House, the Breakers in Newport that, I mean, have more, you know, I mean, have more servants probably than small countries. Um, They're huge. And so what you're seeing is a justification of wealth, but also it's kind of taking you to another world. You can go and have this, you can have lobster and champagne, which are very luxurious. You would go after the theater. So clearly you don't have to get up first thing in the morning and work. Um, It's also a place where you can be a little bit naughty. You can bring your mistress. A lot of people brought their mistresses and not their wives, Um, but it's really trying to create this other worldly um, experience. It's kind of like an immersive virtual reality experience before there was such a thing. So you could go and you would see, you know, um, plants draped everywhere and columns. And in Murray's Roman Gardens, they also have like, they have copies of the Caryatids from the Erechtheon on, you know, the Athenian Acropolis. And those are there. And there's also an elaborately designed fountain. If you went to a different floor, it was all... It was all based around Cleopatra and Mark Anthony, who are now looking fine um, <laughs> and are not presented as, as moral problems. Uh-huh. Um, and there were private rooms. And so I think part of it is just like, here's the fun life. And we want to have these fabulous dining establishments and we have enough money to do it. And, you know, people start to go out to be seen rather than stay at home and have their private chef. Um, and so, you know, there are even ones that are later. There's one that has, um, Lama Sous in them. That's called the cafe. Um, what was it called? The Cafe de la Opera. And that has all these Babylonian and Assyrian references. And partially like Babylon is being presented as kind of, okay, it's falling over there and it's kind of really luxurious <laughs> and maybe it's very sinful, but you know, we have great food. So come on in. <laughs> so I also think there's a competitive landscape, which is like, you have mm-hmm. to do something Roman because somebody's doing something Italian over there and right. they're kind of competing and trying to make it really, really fabulous. So you'll come and spend your hard earned cash or inherited wealth that uh, way. Right. Oh, that's fascinating. I remember on a recent visit to New York, I saw the old uh, Delmonico's building where they have what, what yes. are rumored, rumored to be two Roman columns flanking the entrance. I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, I don't know if it's true. And Delmonico's, of course, was the first place who kind of right. did mm-hmm. fine uh, dining. There are there are columns lurking everywhere. So the oh, yes. Untermeyer Gardens, which um, mm-hmm. Samuel Untermeyer was the first very, very successful Ameri- American attorney, but he built these beautiful gardens for his estate. It's now up in Yonkers, mm-hmm. but he has a stairway that's mastered after the Ville d'Este, and at the bottom are two Roman columns that are supposed to be from Stanford White's estate. The rest of hmm. the garden is designed as a cross between a mogul garden, but it also has mosaics and Greek architect. It's fabulous. It's worth another trip when you're in New York. Huh. Um, but but there are also a lot of columns that are gifted. Um, so like New York City has a column that... Um, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan gave uh, part of the 64-65 World's Fair. And then Mussolini's, Mussolini gave Chicago a, a column mm-hmm. for Balbo. And then he also gave columns to two different cities in Brazil related to aviation. Oh, so really? there are Roman <laughs> columns lurking everywhere if you can find them. So I don't ca- I've never managed to confirm whether Delmonico's has actually got them or not. I have to go and look more closely, but I'm not sure. But it's a good story anyway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
It is, right? So obviously the, the appeal of the exotic is nothing new. Um, wonderful. So the association of Rome and luxury um, also extended, fittingly enough, to baths. Um, can you tell us a bit about the, uh, the Fleischmann baths and how their appearance drew on um, popular perceptions, I would say, of the Romans? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's, again, building a little bit on um, the interest in the lobster palaces. But, you know, you know, New York is not the cleanest place. Um, and if you can offer a kind of opportunity to bathe like a Roman emperor um, at a, a price that certain people can afford, New Yorkers kind of love it. So <laughs> the Fleischmann's Baths were located at 42nd Street and 6th Avenue, which isn't very far from where a lot of the lobster palaces are. It's all kind of between 6th and 8th Avenue near Broadway, 42nd Street. And so this was a massive um, complex in the Bryant Park building, and it had over 54,000 square feet of space. And so you could come in um, and bathe. Now, the publicity ma um, materials, again, said this was like the Baths of Agrippa, Titus, Caracalla and Diocletian. So it's like, if you have ever been to Rome, you're like, I've been to the Baths of Diocletian. I've been to the Baths of Caranella, Caracalla. And it kind of promoted it as being accurate, but, you know, accuracy is flexible. <laughs> um, and so in theory, you know, they had all the set rooms. You could go to a tepidarium, a collidarium, but you went in through this room called an ancillarium. Now, I am a, I'm a material culture person. That's not a real Latin word. <laughs> um, that's a made up word. Um, but I think that's interesting. There was also this... Um, saying when you would come in, abandon hope, all ye who, uh, abandon hope, all who enter here and do as the Romans did, which is a total corruption of Dante. Yes. Um, so exactly. It's kind of bizarre. <laughs> and you're a little bit like, really? But that's the point. The point is that it kind of, it's alluding to something classical and to the luxury of that classical world, or particularly of the Roman empire and the Roman baths, but it's kind of updating it and playing it. And it's playing a little fast and loose. So you could think about this as like a little, little bit of a precursor to some of the things that happen in Vegas, the same thing with the lobster palaces. Like, you know, you're going to have Caesar's Palace, and it kind of looks like the shops are called the Forum. Um, but you're going to go and you're going to have a bath experience here, and so you can swim. And I think people, you know, people wouldn't have huge, excellent bathing facilities at home. Um, the cost of going in was a dollar. Um, now, it cost, I think, like 36 cents for a pound of butter. A pound of butter is four sticks of butter. So this is not affordable to most people at all. This is affordable to people who are, you know, upper middle class, upper class who can afford this. And they had a special club that was called the Diocletian Club. And it costs like, you'd have to spend a, I think a hundred dollars a year. And they would press your shirts and they would do all these things for you. And you had private rooms. So I guess the idea was if you had to work all day and then go out to like a fancy party at night or a fancy dinner, they would take care of your black tie or your white tie, probably your white tie. Hmm. And they would make you, then you could do that. Um, so it's again, playing in this idea of luxury and bespoke experience. And, you know, we've gone from the Roman Republic being something and civic values of Rome being valued to kind of luxury and pleasure being valued. And luxury and pleasure have always sat very uncomfortably in an American landscape. Mm -hmm. um, but people know that, you know, Americans really in New York would like to have some luxuries, I guess. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, it, it seems almost uh, almost postmodern the way they, they combine, they jumble these references. And it's playful in the sense that, you know, you, you know, you're seeing what you're not seeing, but it's okay because it's still fun. I don't know. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No, it's exactly right. Like, I don't think, I think the thing that's interesting is like, they don't feel bound by any of the constraints that, mm -hmm. you know, a scholar might feel. And that's why it's so fascinating and why it shows you that. I think also we often tend to think of classical architecture as being very academic and it's like, oh, it's a bank building. Oh, it's a, it's a church. Uh, it's a, excuse me. It's a um, court of law. It's a municipal building. But then there are all these really weird, wacky riffs that show people that that this world was a, a larger part of the American consciousness, maybe in certain ways, than we would have expected. And in different places, it kind of pops up. No, mm -hmm. oh, very much. So to move to an entirely less fun world in which our, this world <laughs> that this is all referenced, um, architects draw on different associations, of course, when designing tombs for New York's elite. Um, so what, I guess, what range of ancient buildings and cultures are the mausoleums of New York's grandees evoking in this period? Um, they really have fun at the ancient world. Um, so there are temples, um, and that makes a lot of sense. So partially because if you are a banker um, and you have a bank that 
you know, you work in, um, or you have a company that's associated like, you know, the Bankers Trust Building, which is a skyscraper that has the mausoleum of Holly Carnassus on the top, mm -hmm. you might say, Ooh, I want to have a temple, uh, that I can be buried in. So many of the financiers pick classical architecture, sometimes very hard to differentiate whether it's Greek or Roman, um, and build their temples, uh, build their tombs that way. And they have their names and they have beautiful stained glass windows from Tiffany. Um, mm. And these are often, you can find them in New York's two most prominent rural cemeteries, Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, and then Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. So people like um, uh, Jay Gould, Samuel Huntington, who, you know, in charge of the railroads, they both have classical style tombs. Uh, in uh, Woodlawn Cemetery. And uh, Jay Gould's tomb has got the biggest piece of land. It's a big circle. And he's got a tomb that's got the Ionic Order, and it seems to be a riff on the Eric Theon's uh, order. Um, so you have temples, but they also, there's a lot of Egyptian architecture. And that's partially, again, because of this Egyptian association uh, with the funereal and the commemorative. Um, so we do see obelisks. That's the most common. Um, but there are two pyramids at least two pyramids in Brooklyn, um, in Greenwood. Um, one for Henry Berg, who is the founder of the ASPCA. Um, he, so the American Society for the Pre uh, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. He loved Egypt. He went there on his honeymoon. And actually underneath Cleopatra's Needle, the obelisk that Egypt gave to the United States, there is a time capsule and he put things in there from the ASPCA. Hmm. Um, he actually dies in the, the Great Blizzard of 1888. And his sons picked this model and build it for him. So he has a pyramid, um, but there are other pyramids. So some people picked pyramids, which is totally wacky. So if you go walking in Greenwood, you can find some pyramids. Um, but also super interesting, um, there are some that are almost exact copies. So in the Bronx, there's the uh, Bach Mausoleum for Jules S. Bach, who is a financier. And he went to Egypt, and we know he collected Egyptian antiquities because he gave some to the Met. Um, and he designed a tomb that was designed 20 years before he died. And it is a copy of the Bark kiosk of Trajan um, that's on Philae, except he put a little cella so he could, you know, they could actually put the bodies in oh, the center wow. of it. But it is like almost an exact copy. So when you look at it, you, you can pick the two pictures up and he clearly picked a building that he liked. And we know the original design, although the landscape doesn't exist today, was designed to have Egyptian plants. He hired a landscape architecture to use indigenous American plants to copy it. Um, and he was supposed to have sphinxes that were going to be on the, the <laughs> property. You can see that on the blue plans, although they don't survive today. So again, I think it's a little bit of a combination of personal preference and kind of social belonging. So if all the financiers have a tomb, I want a tomb mm -hmm. um, that looks like a classical temple. But then you have someone like Jules Bach who has this very thoughtfully designed uh, building and the same thing for Henry Berg. At least his sons executed it for him. We know that they paid for it rather than him, but we know he loved ancient Egypt and went there. So um, again, it seems like everything is a treasure trove from antiquity that you can pull from and design. So one of the best things anyone can do when they're in New York is go walking in the rural cemeteries. It's a really mm -hmm. fascinating thing to do. Oh, yes. I mean, even here in Chicago, that there's three rural cemeteries and uh, Green, uh, sorry, Graceland is pretty close to here. Um, and there, there's the same blend of influences where there's Egyptian pyramids and there's a wonderful Phoenic temple built um, for the Palmers uh, right on the edge of this lake. So uh, they, they had fun with these references and obviously they're looking at each other's tombs and trying to outdo each other, but uh, all within the same neo-antique field of reference. Absolutely. So uh, moving on to uh, broader questions. Um, to what extent uh, was New York's neo-antique architecture distinctive um, or independent um, of national and international trends? A very big question, I know, but we can kind of grapple with that. Well, it's almost kind of what you, you actually have set me up beautifully to say this about commenting about what Chicago's mm -hmm. cemeteries look like. Um, it's in conversation with a lot of what's going on in the rest of the United States and, and in the world. Um, and there's really an interest in using these ancient forms in the United States, partially because you largely have a young country and a young country looking for usable pasts mm -hmm. that can give it history and connections to what many Americans perceive to be the old world, um, to be the place that their ancestors came from. And so I think there's a real interest in that. Um, and so in that sense, New York is very kind of on brand. Um, one thing it does do is a lot of its skyscrapers really do use ancient motifs at the tops and the bottoms. 
in a way that then kind of starts to be part of the transition away from ancient stuff, but it's still strategically placed. Uh, But I really think it's part of what's going on in the United States. Um, I think the thing is, one of the reasons why I was fascinated is no one ever thinks about New York in this light. Um, And in some ways, it's very American and not so exceptional, even if all of us New Yorkers like to clamor on (laughs) about how special we are and how great our city is. Um, I think in that sense, it's very conversant with the trends that are going on. I mean, the Royal Cemeteries start in Philadelphia and Cambridge, Massachusetts, before they start in New York. And um, for Greenwood, they're looking at models of cemeteries and um, plot design from Ohio. So it's really part of a conversation in the United States, I think. And New York is just a very active member of that conversation. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So to ask an even bigger and I guess less answerable question. Um, at what point, in your opinion, um, does neoclassical or neo-antique architecture become just American architecture? Where would we draw this line between influence and its uh, translation, I suppose, into this American context? Oh, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I think in some ways it's always American because mm-hmm. what we do, what Americans do with it is unique to an American context. But I'd say maybe there starts to be a transition after the Civil War. Um, And that's partially because you're having really the first generations of trained American architects, where before you had builders um, Mm -hmm. who had some type of training or they were they were imported from abroad, like people would emigrate to the United States, where you're now starting to have architects um, who've gone to Beaux-Arts or they've gone to Rome And yes, they're really looking to Europe for certain things, but they're taking in all these different styles and they're starting to work in different ways. And I also think like, you know, uh, the advent of new building types and building materials also starts to change those conversations as well. But I would say really by the time, you know, we're getting to the peak of this is almost by the time it's over, but around by 1890s, 1900. I mean, there's a very famous exhibition from Brooklyn in the late 1970s, late 1970s, which is called the American Renaissance. And it's using that word, but it's kind of talking about Renaissance and classical architecture and that it's always American because it's this unique mm-hmm. type of adaptation. So maybe I would say it's always American architecture and yet at the same time in conversation with broader trends and traditions. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good way to think about it. That it's, it's both at once. And so to think about the end of this, this conversation, or at least to kind of the, the muting of this conversation, um, why does a neo-antique archite- architecture become so profoundly unfashionable um, starting <laughs> in the, around the, well, the mid, mid, mid to eighth century above all? And are there um, any contexts in which the classical world is still used today in contemporary building in New York or elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, it, it gets really unfashionable, uh, particularly after World War One. I. I think mm-hmm. part of it is people give up, like progress is not inevitable because people have just gone through this horrific war. And also people are starting to play with forms and ideas. They don't want to immediately look to something in the past. If we are meant to be looking to the future, you can't just use old styles of buildings to do that. And changes in zoning laws, when they mm-hmm. create the first zoning laws, like Um, where there have to be setbacks in New York City on the skyscrapers because the equitable life building, um, you know, is so tall that it blocks all the light of Trinity Church, then you have to have these setbacks. If you have to have setbacks, you're not going to put architectural sculpture on your setbacks in the same way because you need that light. So I think there start to be some changes in attitudes um, and also just a more forward-looking rather than backward-looking architectural practice. That said, even Lewis Sullivan, who hates, 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 hates with a capital H, everything at the White City, even though Daniel Burnham made sure he had a job and helped him do the, you know, Mm -hmm. Lewis Sullivan's a complicated character. (laughs) He still liked some, fundamentally, some of the ideas that Vitruvius articulated about form, function, and utility underscore a lot of skyscrapers. And even Lewis Sullivan likes these ideas. So there are fundamental ideas and proportions of buildings that still exist. So like the Seagram building, like that Mm -hmm. has an interest in structures and proportions that people wanted to use. Now there are other examples outside the US, like there's what's called severe, you know, classicism where it's really stripped down. Um, But really as a kind of conventional major style in New York, it's basically 
kind of done by 1920. I mean, there are still obviously architectural schools in the United States that teach quote unquote classical architecture, most notably Notre Dame, um, Catholic University too. But, you know, the viability of it as a form for office buildings, for new courts um, in the, in New York city is not that possible. But for example, I think it's in, is it in Alabama? One of the new courts that was built there is built in a classical style that somehow it's still associated um, with justice and integrity. Um, So I think it's kind of New York is too cynical a place now for this, but I think that Mm -hmm. these forms still exist in the United States um, in interesting ways. Hmm. Yeah, you know, of course, here in Chicago, it's um, Mies van der Rohe was based here for a long time. The international yeah. style is all over the place. A lot of, you know, glassy steel boxes. Um, but of course, there is still this sense of symmetry and proportion that is based, however distantly, in classical mm-hmm. architecture. But it's, it is very distant sometimes. Yeah, it is. Uh, so to finish, um, on a kind of a fun note, um, do you have a favorite neo-antique building or monument in New York City? Um. It's a little bit like asking me to pick a favorite child. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. I would say yes, I do. I have a. I, can I give you like a few because I can't sure. pick just one. Mm-hmm. Um, so first of all, Gould Memorial Library in the Bronx on Bronx Community College's campus. It was um, designed by Stanford White, and it is this spectacular built library built modeled on the Pantheon. Um, it is visible from Upper Manhattan. You go inside. It has got amazing green Connemara marble, the names of different um, lawgivers and scientists. And you walk into that space, even though having studied at a round library in the UK at the Radcliffe camera, like Mm. round libraries are terrible for actually working in. (laughs) Um, It's such a beautiful space and it had an Oculus and it's just amazing at Tiffany Glass. And it was like, I walking into that building, even though it needs a lot of repairs, I still go in and I go, wow, I want to study and learn. I'm inspired by this space. (laughs) So that is worth a trip to the Bronx. Um, On the Upper West Side, the Pythian Temple, because it is Mm. simply the wackiest building I've ever seen. Um, I think it's on 71st. um, And it has Lamassus from Assyria. It has basically four statues on the top of the building that look like the colossal statues from Abu Simbel. It has sacrificial bowls. It has like onks. It has, you know, solar discs. And it's just so weird because it was built for the Knights of Pythias, which were a fraternal order. And it mm-hmm. basically threw Egyptian and Assyrian reliefs in a building and was like, have fun. Um, and so I remember it's just so wacky. Um, and then I love the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch in Brooklyn. Um, New York actually has a lot of arches. Um, Washington Square Arch too, but the Soldiers and Sailors one is super interesting to me because it's built in this moment after the Civil War um, that you see a lot of commemorative monuments going up. Uh, Many of the very controversial Confederate soldiers monuments are going up in the South while this is going up in Brooklyn. And it really celebrates uh, the average enlisted man. Um, It has an Army and Navy, so it's celebrating the veterans who were just veterans. They weren't, um, Grant and Lincoln are both in the memorial, but they're on the inside. It's about Brooklynites. And it's also interesting because it depicts and includes in one of the groups, an um, African-American individual too. And so it really talks and engages with interesting moments to commemorate all these people in a way that we don't always see that happening in memorials. And it has its issues too, but it's really worth going to Brooklyn to see. So I could go on for hours about all the buildings I should, you should go see in Manhattan, but those are three of my favorites. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure I'll check these out next time I'm in New York. Um, well, Professor Rick McCauley, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Um, and to anyone intrigued by this, um, I highly recommend um, her book, uh, Antiquity in Gotham, which covers um, all of these facets of uh, the neo-antique in New York City. Um, so with that, uh, thanks again. Um, and to everyone listening, thank you very much and tune in again soon. Thank you so much. Of course.